And with the tolling of the bell, hi, I'm Diane Perino. I'm on the Justice Task Force, and we've been working for over a year on our land acknowledgement. In that process, we realized a couple of things are really important. One is that you can't um, verbalize a land acknowledgement without an action uh, to go along with it. And the other is that we have such a unique um, relationship in this church and in this community with the indigenous people that used to be on this land that it's really important that everyone, before we um, do a land acknowledgement, that everyone understands that history. Luckily, we have Josh Hall, who is a lifetime member of the congregation, a local boy who uh, is a student of history teaches in Lee at the high school and works at the Stockbridge Archives. Um, he is uh, not only very knowledgeable, but he's a lot of fun to listen to and we're really thrilled he's here. He did a talk also in April, which I listened to again uh, last week and it's really interesting. I, I encourage you all to go on our church's website to the service and justice page you'll find a link, link to his talk from April, which I think will cover a lot of this stuff before what you're covering today, the earlier history. Um, but that's there, and there's a lot of other information on that webpage about the Stockbridge Muncie tribe of the Mohicans and the history we have with them. Um, for those of you who are a part of our congregation, thank you for staying, I think this is important. Uh, stuff to listen to before we vote on our land acknowledgement in two weeks. Next week there'll be a Q&A about um, our land acknowledgement after church. The February 4th meeting is also a budget meeting, so there'll be a Q&A about both the budget and the land acknowledgement next week. Um, for those of you who are not part of the congregation, welcome, we're really glad other people are here. This is important stuff for the whole community. And I turn it over to Josh. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everybody uh, here present in the sanctuary and those who may be uh, online for tuning in today. Uh, it, it, it actually was very surprising that it was April that I spoke because it doesn't seem as though it was really that long ago. Um, so maybe that's a good thing that it seems like it was only yesterday that, that I was here talking uh, and part of that also may be the fact that this is something that I do on a regular basis. Uh, I am a student of history, and history is important for us to, to know, to understand, and to kind of 
to take a step back and, and look at things, I try with my students at the high school to get them to understand we need to step out of our 21st century viewpoint. We need to, and it's not easy, uh, we need to take a step back and, and look at things from a different perspective. And part of that is listening. Uh, sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with teenagers, listening is not, uh, is not always an, an easy thing to do. Um, so I, I thank you uh, again. I, I'm not an expert on any of this information. Uh, as a student, uh, I try to do as much research. Sometimes I go down multiple rabbit holes when it comes to looking for information on these different topics. Uh, and as part of that, I would like to say thank you to Shirley Blanchard and everybody who is involved with the, the creation of our uh, history that's going on right now. As our building turns 200 years old, uh, this was another reason to kind of delve into how we got to the point where we decided that we were going to build the structure that has lasted uh, going on 200 years. In going down one of the rabbit holes of research, uh, personalities, we, we, we know that each individual has their own personality, and the same is true for the three individuals that uh, I will talk about, uh, Jonathan, or John Sargent, Jonathan Edwards, and Stephen West. Each one had their own interesting personality, which kind of led them in the decisions that they made, the way they interacted with the populations that they did, uh, and, and really it explains our story and what happens with the indigenous population here. <clears throat> and, and going through that, I was reminded uh, reading about Jonathan Edwards that Jonathan Edwards, in some interpretations, was an extremely intense individual, that he was a, a theologian of theologians, which is why you can find him in history books, The Great Awakening, so on and so forth. And it was in some ways humorous. They were talking about how when people came to the meeting house that would have been out uh, in front of this building in the area where the, the children's chimes is, that he would be there. And it was an expectation that you would be there for an extended period of time. It would be an extended stay. So. When, when we come to church, you know, we're, we're here for an hour, maybe a little bit of time before, some time after, there's always coffee hour. So by the time everything's said and done, perhaps we've been here for an hour and a half, and for those that are diehards, two hours. And I think that pales in comparison to the amount of time that would have been spent in a wooden structure that on a day like today where it's eight degrees outside and the wind is howling and no matter where you sat in the pew, there was a, there was a warm feeling inside your heart as our three, four, and possibly five came through because you were being inspired by what Edwards was saying because that was probably the only thing that was keeping you all that warm at that particular time. So I envisioned at one point being here talking to all of you, everybody having come in from the parking lot, wind howling, cold and everything, and Diane told me that there's no choir practice after this and so on, so I hope you're all here for the long run. <laughs> so today's talk is Indian Town to Exodus, and that brought to mind uh, a quote from the book of Exodus that I believe I will get right, and if I don't, my apologies to uh, all of those learned scholars. Moses once said that I am a stranger in a strange land, and I think to some extent that epitomizes both the feeling of Sergeant Edwards and West but I also think that at some point it also epitomizes what the indigenous population felt as well, that they were strangers in a strange land. 
And is this because of moving? Possibly. But I think over time, the area that they had come to know had changed so much, and the people around them had changed so much that they felt that they were strangers in a strange land, despite the fact that they would call this area home. So in my talk back in April, I know that I, I tried to go through as much of the early history of the church as possible uh, and the establishment of Indian Town. So some of this will be a, a repeat of what I talked about back in April. But I think that it's, it's good to kind of go over again the, the foundation and then move on forward. So this area, Indian Town, uh, six square miles, that's it, six square miles, out of the entire area that was originally from the Hudson River to the Housatonic down into the Connecticut area, all of that land, Mohican land, and eventually at one point here in Massachusetts as the English are beginning to encroach uh, from the east and you have the Dutch that are encroaching from the west, the population, the indigenous population in this area is condensed into six square miles. That is called Indian Town. So you have all of this territory and then you're, you're stuck on six square miles. And it takes quite a bit to re change everything that you have had in your mind as what is your environment and condense it down into six square miles. To some extent, I'm sure it's no different than going from a house that has 18 rooms to an apartment that now has five. Your environment has changed, you're in a different area. Some of it may be recognizable, but overall it's not. So Indian Town takes the population, and part of this, as I explained in April, is because the English population wanted to consolidate everybody into one area. So Indian Town, as much as it is described as a territory that is set aside for the Mohican Indians, or the Housatonic Indians, that six square miles is a reservation in some ways. It is a holding pen because they wanted everybody into that particular six square miles so that the rest of the land around it was open. Now as that's happening, we already have established uh, communities in Sheffield and we have communities in Great Barrington, but the indigenous population is eventually going to move into this six square miles. And even then, this, in the six square miles, one sixteenth of that area is supposed to be uh, set aside for land for ministry. One sixteenth of that land is set aside for a school and just enough land, not defined, to accommodate four English families. They haven't arrived yet, but to accommodate four English families. And Electra Jones, in her uh, history of the town, uh, talks about how the selection of those four families has not yet been determined, but uh, we are not that they are not to be admitted for the comfort or for their social honor, but especially, especially to civilize and anglicize the Indians and to help them in their secular affairs. And that is her understanding for the reasoning of having these four families eventually move into this area. So May 1735, the population for the most part has moved into this six square miles and we open up now with John Sargent. So John Sargent, our minister in the wilderness, um, he, is, he has attended Yale, uh, starts there in 1725, and from there has been appointed a tutor. And I think looking at John Sargent, there are so many different reasons why he chose to do what he did. Part of that has to do with a, an affliction, an infirmity that happened to him when he was young. 
Uh, he wound up having a, a cut to his hand, to his arm, when he was young as a result of a, a farming accident. So going forward in any type of military career or farming wasn't going to work for him because of this injury that in some ways defined him. So he decided that he was going to eventually go into theology. He's going to attend Yale and he becomes a tutor. And when he hears of the opportunity of coming to this area, to Indian Town, to what eventually becomes Stockbridge, he embraces this idea. He wants to do this. This is this he sees almost as his life work. This is, if there's one thing that he wants to accomplish, he wants to be able to come to this area because he sees going into the wilderness and talking and spreading the gospel to the indigenous population as something that he can do. This is what he can excel at, and he believes that he will do this relatively well. So Yale says to him, we'll give you three months, we'll, we will let you go, uh, we'll forego your tutoring at the moment, you get three months, you get to go up to Massachusetts, go on a vacation, and I know I joked about how you know, here we have outsiders coming into Massachusetts, uh, but he comes to Massachusetts for the purpose of, in some ways, meeting his pupils for the first time, meeting his flock for the first time, and seeing what it is that he can do. He gets three months in order to figure this out. And Yale says, you've got three months, if this works, then we'll consider something, you have to come back and you have to finish out your tutoring. But once that's done, we may let you go. It depends. So he comes up here and he spends his three months introduced to the people, to, into the Mexicans, the indigenous population that's here. And again, he has this revelation, he keeps meticulous diaries of all of the experiences that he is going to have while he is here. And he is overwhelmed with what goes on in those three months. And while he's here, he is trying to figure out what is the best way to work with this population. None of this would have worked, keep in mind, without the help of the tribe without somebody to interpret the language for sergeant, none of this would have worked. So the tribe is there. We know that there were tribal individuals. The reason why sergeant is there is because the tribe has reached out. They would like somebody to come and talk about uh, the gospel. They want a teacher. So there is that portion of it, but without the tribe, none of this would have worked because Sergeant has no idea what the language is. Uh, again, those things that pop into your head, I can only imagine as a child or as an individual who went into a, a Catholic church pre-Vatican II, you walk into the church and they're speaking in a language that you have no idea. The closest you may have seen is e pluribus unum on the back of a coin. Uh, so listening in Latin, I'm sure that the feeling was mutual in that any time Sargent is talking to the members of the tribe, there is a big question mark uh, that is coming up. And as Sargent is sitting there and talking or listening, that he too is, is trying to figure things out. But Sargent is willing to undergo, he dives into the idea of trying to figure out what the language is he uses interpreters, and he tries to get as much out of the three months that he can in order to figure out what the next step is. He goes back to Yale, and he says, I, I have to do this. He, he talks about his entire experience, and everybody is convinced that this is what John Sargent needs to do. Uh, that he is the person that is fit for this particular, this particular venture. So he goes back to Yale, spends three months tutoring, and I'm sure that his mind was not necessarily on tutoring itself, uh, and the students that were there, I guarantee that his mind was, was elsewhere, back here in the forests in Stockbridge, 
uh, trying to figure out what the next step is. What is, what is my, as any good teacher, what is my curriculum? What is my next step? How am I going to work through this? Uh, and I'm sure that his tutors, uh, his tutees, also received you know, um, some type of, of lesson in what he was going to do next. In order to help him, also, when he returned to Yale, he took two, uh, two children, two Native children with him, the idea, again, being that he would be able to continue to work on his language skills, and they, too, would be able to work on their English so that down the road, once he returned, perhaps he already felt as though he was returning regardless of what was happening, uh, that this, this whole system would continue. So he finishes off his three months back in tutoring, and they say, you have our blessing, have fun in Massachusetts. Uh, so he leaves, and he r returns to the Stockbridge area, and he is supposed to be receiving a salary of 100 pounds, which is a considerable amount of money in the 1730s. Uh, and I'm sure that one of the questions that comes up is, where do you get that money? Where does, where does that money come from? So he arrives... In his absence, Timothy Woodbridge, who uh, I will remind you is the teacher, he has been here, he has been uh, con continuing to work with the tribe and is doing an amazing job. Now we have the, the, the duo back in Stockbridge. We have both Sergeant and we have Woodbridge. We have our minister and we have our teacher and things move forward. But I mentioned personalities, and I, I mentioned that there is what our perceptions are. And even, even then, uh, and I think sometimes we, we have this perception as, as Sergeant being this fantastic individual, and I'm not saying that he, he wasn't. Um, but when we look at the words that he used, again, uh, he talks about the tragedy of the Indians. He talks about working with the heathens. And again, definition, when you define a group of people as down and out, as a tragic group of people, as heathens, as you know, whatever the label may possibly be, I think that that's something that we need to keep in mind. What, how he felt, clearly I believe, I believe that Sargent had a genuine love in his heart for the work that he did while he was here. But there is a preconceived notion, there is a, a historical understanding that the individuals that are here are not civilized that the people that are here are not like us. It's us and them. And so even though maybe we don't want to think about that in terms of uh, Sargent and his, his work with the Mohican Indians, I think in reality that is something we need to keep in mind, that there was an us and them. So I leave that there. But he wanted to do the work, he was willing to do this, and he and Woodbridge were willing to work together. They were willing to make this mission happen. And it does. Our story is that it does. Our mission here in Stockbridge lasts 40 years. So from 1735 to 1775, the mission here exists. Uh, but what is our mission? Is our mission to work with the indigenous population? Is our mission to spread the gospel? Is our mission to civilize this area that is in the wilderness? Uh, there are a number of different ways and ideas that we can look at. So, Sergeant 
begins his work, he dives headfirst. He and Woodbridge are going to establish schools. They are going to have students. And sometimes the way that some of the, the literature is written, students is not necessarily defined, which I think is a good thing because I don't think there was a clear definition of students. Um, I am a student, all of you are students. Uh, so it covers a wide variety. Sometimes we hear students and we're like, oh, okay, kids from the age of five up to 18. No, not necessarily. Uh, at one point there was a definition, 10 to 20 was a definition of what a student was. But in those early days, the, the definition of student was anybody who wanted to learn, anybody who was willing to come to the school to listen and to learn. So they go about this. Sargent earns a reputation as to what he and Woodbridge are doing. The outside world, Boston, Springfield, uh, even over into New York State, Albany, and clear across the pond, hear of what Sargent is doing here at the Indian Town Mission. And it's that knowledge, it's that understanding of what he is trying to do, what he is accomplishing, that funds everything, uh, that brings in the money that pays for his salary, that will pay for Woodbridge's salary, uh, donations of books so that uh, sermons can be written, so that lessons can be taught. Uh, I know back in April I mentioned the Bible, the two-volume Bible that is eventually donated uh, from England by, with funds from the Prince of Wales and so on that will eventually make its way to Stockbridge. All of that comes from news of what is happening. Sargent travels as, as word gets out about what is happening here, about the interaction, about the teaching and the Christianization, you know, what, was, what the parameters were for the Indian town. As information gets out, there are others in the vicinity who say, we like what you're doing, we want to know more, can you come and talk to us? Or, we will come to you. And so, Sargent must have been doing something positive as he was here uh, with the establishment of the school and with the establishment of the church. But again, uh, part of this is, I'm a stranger in a strange land, understanding what's going on. In his journals, Sargent talks about how uh, he is here to observe also what is going on, what is the tribe doing. Part of that is so that he can understand and possibly make connections with their religious ideas and their ceremonies and how that can connect, making connections to what Christianity has to talk about. Uh, there was one, uh, one journal entry where he talks about how the, the native population wants to have him be part of a ceremony, and he said, I, I am happy to observe and I'm happy to, uh, to watch and, and be here, but if it's something that has to do with religion, I, I don't feel comfortable being part of that. And they said, no. No, this is, this is part of our ceremony, but not necessarily religious. And it wound up being uh, a ceremony that takes place a year after somebody has passed. And it has to do with remembering that individual. And for all intents and purposes, it seems like he was very touched by that memorial that was taking place. It was an opportunity for him to learn and to understand what the tradition was of the tribe going forward. People in Boston, because of what Sargent was doing, sent a conch shell. And the purpose of the conch shell was to announce that services were about to begin. And they sent money also that somebody, a tribal member, would be paid not only to sweep out the, uh, the mission, but also to blow the conch shell. So, there is this idea of bringing in members of the tribe and making them part of the ceremony, being part, taking ownership of what's going on here. And 
along those lines, with Sergeant having ideas, but with Sergeant being here and not fully understanding what was going on, he decided that he was going to talk with Reverend Samuel Hopkins, who was down in Great Barrington. And there was a constant uh, writings and discussions between the two of them as to what should happen. And I think that Hopkins, in his, his work, in his, his letters, uh, having worked with the, the tribal members before Sargent had even arrived, that Hopkins um, understood what Sargent wanted to do, appreciated his zeal, but there was one piece that Hopkins mentioned to Sargent that I don't know either was fully understood or over time wasn't uh, manifested in the way that perhaps Hopkins had hoped. And that was, go and build your mission. Go and build the school. Talk to them. Spread the Christ Christian word. But they need to take ownership. The tribe needs to be the one that does this. Because the more we get involved, the more it's about us. If you give them ownership, it's about them. It's about what they have learned. It's about what they are doing. And I think at some point, that got lost, that there was potentially a change. Again, personalities, potentially. Um, but I think that was sound advice. And perhaps had it been um, heated more, things would have been slightly different. But Paul Klein, who is a... Uh, an individual who wrote a, a history on the education uh, here in Stockbridge, uh, education in Stockbridge, talks about uh, some of the, the roadblocks that were present at that time. And one of the roadblocks uh, that comes up as we go through the 1730s into the 1740s is language. Now, I already mentioned that without the use of interpreters, none of this would have worked. Sargent does an excellent job of learning the language, eventually preaching in the, the native tongue, uh, Woodbridge likewise, but not everybody is going to be a sergeant, and not everybody is going to be a Woodbridge. And as we get the four families that are supposed to arrive, the Williamses, the Joneses, keeping up with them, the Browns, and Timothy Woodbridge's brother, those four families, as they arrive as individuals, and within a couple years, as families, the idea of not using English, or English not being the primary language, becomes difficult. Language is important. Language is how we communicate, it's how we understand each other, it's how we learn. Whatever the language is, it's important. Sargent understood that, Woodbridge understood that, not everybody understood that. It's, it, will, it will take a number of decades before the tribal members start to use English as their primary language. They gave something up. They gave up their language as their primary form of communication. <clears throat> they made a change. It started to redefine them. Sargent, as he goes through and is trying to figure out the best way to talk, the best way to preach, the best way to teach, redefines the people that are here, whether he meant to or whether it was by accident. Language is one way that he, that, that is a change. Social norms. 
in the indigenous population, the farmers are the women. The hunters are the men. European society doesn't see things that way. European society sees agrarian society. The men are taking care of the fields, they're plowing, the women are at home. Native society talks about <clears throat> a matriarchal society. European society begrudgingly from time to time. <clears throat> it's a patriarch. So looking at these different things, changing things. When a, when a school is established, the curriculum for the male population that's at the school is agrarian. And for the female population is housekeeping. It's in the home. Another change that needs to be accepted. Not immediately, but if that's what's being taught, that's a change. The Williams family and Stockbridge, I think that it has a, a, a difficult relationship that even continues today in trying to understand exactly what Ephraim Williams wanted to do, what his motives are, and what the Williams family over time, because the Williams family and its legacy stretches through all three of our ministers, Sergeant Edwards and West. What's happening, what's going on, what are the changes that they're looking for? Is it land, is it power, is it prestige, is it money? Well, 1739 brought a change here in Stockbridge and it brought a change in the Reverend John Sargent. Um, by 1739, we have a growing English population in the area. The four families, as I said, Williams, Brown, Jones, and Woodbridge, their families have now come to this area. Ephraim Williams decides to build a house up on Prospect Hill. It is now Windermere, number five Prospect Hill. And he has a very nice house and he has a family. He has a daughter. Abigail. John Sargent's doing it the best that he can, but in 1739, he gets married. He marries Abigail Williams. And there are a number of historians who talk about how there was a marked change in what Sargent was doing. He continued to preach. He continued to teach, but there was a different priority. Abigail was there. He had gotten married. He was beginning a family. Abigail's view of the indigenous population was not the same as John's. John Sargent, at one point, built a house on the plain road so that he was within walking distance of the mission. That will change. There's a bigger and grander house that will be built up on Prospect Hill, the Mission House. That's where they will live. Abigail does not want tribal members coming into the house. There's a back door that they can enter through, not through the front door. So through their interactions, there's a shift in Sargent. And as much as he continues to do the work that he wanted to, as much as he continues to establish what will be called the Hollis School, which will be funded uh, by a gentleman in England by the last name Hollis and so on, there's a change. The tribe is no longer the focal point. It is now Abigail. It is family. They're there. It's to the side. But there is that change. 
Shirley Dunn, who has written extensively about the Mohican Nation uh, and uh, is, is an excellent source, talks about how it, around 1740, there are roughly 120 tribal members living in this area. So 1740, 120 tribal members and a dozen plus English that are living in this particular area. By the time Sargent passes away in 1749, the population amongst the Mohicans in Stockbridge has grown. There are over 200. So that's good, an increase in population. Over the time that Sargent is here as the minister of our church, when he passes, there are 53 family units out of those 200 and 20-ish that are living here in town. 129 individuals have been baptized, uh, a total of 180 tribal members over the time, the entire time that Sergeant is here will be baptized into the church. And by the time Sergeant passes, the number of English has increased to about a dozen families, not a dozen people anymore but to a dozen families in varying sizes. But the English population is beginning to grow. So, Sargent passes in the summer of 1749, and despite the changes that have happened, despite the, the focus of his time, the indigenous population is, is devastated. Uh, even Abigail admits in some of her writings that the lamentations of the indigenous population at his passing are severe, that they are uh, very, very saddened. Uh, and perhaps this is because they knew that they had lost a friend. Uh, perhaps this is also because they didn't know what was going to happen next. What is the next step? What is the future? Uh, perhaps it's out of fear of what will happen next. Again, we have the Williams family. Abigail, not long after her husband's passing, uh, is going to look into the idea of becoming the headmistress of a girls' school. Uh, this is not necessarily going to go over well. There will never be a large group of young ladies uh, who are from the tribe that will want to come and be part of this school. And part of it is because despite the fact that she may want to do this, there are other motivations, financial and, and so on. Uh, personality, what is there, what is their knowledge, shows through, and she is not, from most accounts, a very gracious or kind-hearted individual towards tribal members. So if she wouldn't let them through the front door when her husband was alive, I don't know that she is going to open with, uh, welcome with open arms individuals uh, when it comes to even a boarding school. So. Sergeant passes, and we know that his replacement will eventually be Jonathan Edwards, uh, another Yale graduate. This Hollis School that Sergeant had created, Edwards was on the board of this school. So there may have been reasons why, maybe a little bit of preparation, uh, that Edwards is going to have some knowledge of what's going on here. And when he arrives, He's appointed 1750, starts here 1751. Uh, he arrives, but he's not a John Sargent. He is a Jonathan Edwards. He is a theologian. He is a man of books. He is a man of education. And English is his language. Again, an interpreter is an excellent go-between. Uh, so without an interpreter, Edwards would have been lost. Without an interpreter, uh, things would have gone very differently. 
you have half of your flock that would understand and half that doesn't. So an interpreter is going to be important, but an interpreter in Edwards is going to become key because he is not going to learn the language as Sargent did. His son, Jonathan Sargent, or John, excuse me, Jonathan Edwards Jr., will learn the language and will be a missionary, um, but his father will not. So he comes and he begins his preaching hour after hour after hour. Um, but similar to what happened when we were talking about Sargent and his focus being working with the tribal members, but then shifting after he is married, Edwards focuses on talking to his flock, but his focus is on his writing. It's about the religion. It's about the word of God. It's about freedom of will. It's about him going through and uh, going through his writing and making people understand his viewpoint, supporting what his views are. Uh, and so there is no focus to address specifically the tribal members. So I think that is going to also kind of lend itself to a, a, another piece of separation. There isn't somebody who is really specifically working with the tribe. You have an individual who is saying, well, if you want to be part of us, absolutely. Um, and he will baptize tribal members, he will marry tribal members to each other and so on. But still, there isn't that close proximity. Um, there will be uh, the, the school that will continue, but again, not, not a focus of Edwards. The focus is going to be on the church, is going to be on religion. And again, personalities. Timothy Woodbridge, our, our teacher, seemed to be on a similar uh, plane as Edwards. Timothy Woodbridge did not particularly care for the Williams family. Jonathan Edwards does not particularly care for the, the Williams family. And so even family's inability to mesh is going to play a part in what eventually is going to be the exodus of the tribe. You have Ephraim Williams and you have uh, other members of the family who are looking for land, they're looking for position, uh, they are looking for money. They will take positions overseeing the tribe, but really it's not necessarily in their heart to look out for the well-being, to do what is necessary as the overseers uh, it is more the financial reward that is received. Uh, Woodbridge does not like this. Uh, Abigail Williams, sergeant, uh, eventually will remarry, and her second husband, Joseph Dwight, uh, gets so upset at what's going on uh, and does not particularly care for Edwards that he refuses to go to church. As long as Edwards is at the pulpit, I will not enter the meeting house. Well, think about the example that that's setting, not only for the English, but also for the Mexican population that's here. It's a good thing that he tried to do this with, uh, with Edwards, because if he tried this with West, it would not go over well. But anyway, there is, there is change. What Sargent had established in terms of the school and what Woodbridge continues after Sargent passes, again, people come from all over. There are other, there are Oneida, there are Mohawk, there are other tribe, tribes that will come and they will send people, children and adults, to Stockbridge 
because of what has happened here, because of the learning, but because people can't get along and because people are not able to interact positively with people who are different, the school eventually falls apart. It comes to an end because instead of treating people equally, instead of teaching what the Bible would teach, acceptance, love, so on, that is not what is necessarily taught and eventually it falls apart. And yet, again, had it not been for the tribe in this area, during the French and Indian Wars, during Edward's time and during West's time, we don't know what would have happened. There was a fear in this area about what was going to happen as you go through the various different French and Indian Wars because even though we have a growing English population in this area, we continue to encroach a little bit at a time. The fear of what is out there and the fear of what we don't know because of the native population that surrounds this area is a danger, is a worry. And so during the time of Edwards, there is a fear of what could potentially happen, who could potentially raid this area and cause a Deerfield type situation in Stockbridge, in Berkshire County. The establishment of Fort Massachusetts in what is now North Adams is supposed to guard against that, but there's still a fear of what is happening. So there is a, a plea put out to the indigenous population, please, please join the ranks. Please be here for our protection. And they did. They stayed, they were here, they were willing to protect their area, they were willing to protect the people who were here regardless. So again, a debt owed to the tribe, but not necessarily recognized. Edwards gets his call eventually to uh, head to Princeton, New Jersey, and he leaves Stockbridge. And as he leaves Stockbridge, he says, God bless you all, and he takes off. See you later. <laughs> and each time, because transition is not immediate, you look at the board and the narthex and the dates don't always match. There could be a year or two in between one minister and the next that's here. That leaves a question, what happens next? Who is going to look out for the people? Who is going to be at the pulpit? Who is going to be looking after the children, the tribe, everybody? Who has everybody's best interest at hand and not their own interest at the forefront? So Edwards leaves and we come to Stephen West. Well, Stephen West just happened to be in the area he was in North Adams. He was the chaplain for a short period of time up at Fort Massachusetts. Uh, so the position opened up, and he said, I have no other place to go, so here I am. So trivia question, how long was Stephen West here? <laughs> Correct answer. 60 years, Stephen West will be our minister for 60 years. A third graduate of Yale. Apparently we like people who attend Yale. Ironically also, he marries a Williams. So we're continuing with the Williams. He moves into the house up on Prospect Hill. 
And Stephen West, I think, would have been an interesting character to do a case study about. Again, personalities. Stephen West was five feet tall. And Stephen West seems to be a person who likes order. He is an individual who um, lays out his clothes ahead of time. <laughs> Routine is absolutely necessary. If he's going for a ride to some place to go visit or talk to somebody, his hat and his whip are laid out the night before. We have routine. He didn't necessarily like to travel, but there was a routine. Every single night, devotions were routine. The two pipes that he smoked in the evening were routine. Everything had its order. Everything had its prescribed method and way. And there is a reason why there are rules. So if you like routine, you like rules. And Stephen West liked rules. He was very methodical in his preaching. Not necessarily the uh, individual who would go on and on and on like his predecessor for hours and hours on end, but he had a method to his madness. A quarter of a page of paper with a few bullet notes written down and he was ready to go weeks in advance. He was able to get through the Bible not once but twice in 60 years. And by that point in time, by the time we have Stephen West, the population has changed. The indigenous population, which we've seen rise, is beginning to fall. The English population, which was low, is now increasing. 12 people, 12 families, 120, 218. Everything is beginning to shift. Our views are beginning to shift. Yes. Absolutely. So as we go into the time of Stephen West, it is a shift in what's happening in terms of government, in terms of allocation of land. So um, it is right around the, the 1760s that we have this major change in that land can, can now, be, before this time, land that was owned by tribal members you had to apply to Boston, there had to be agreements, it was a process in order to obtain native land. And after the 1760s, this all changes because you have this shift in the ability to pay your debt by giving up land. And land disappears very quickly after that. I don't know where all the debt came from, but I'm sure that there was a record of it someplace. But um, it is, it's a very different change because, again, ownership, whatever the, the concept of ownership might be, uh, again, going from a large area, six square miles, now you're divvying things up, and now you're giving away what little you have left. So the control or the possession that the tribe had very quickly changes once you get into the, the 1760s because it's much easier to divest individuals of their land. In terms of town government, um, Stockbridge, as I, I have mentioned before, but not today apparently, um, Stockbridge was a very unique situation in that there were tribal members from the very beginning who were part of the government. Uh, they were on the board of selectmen, they held other positions, and as we go through in those, those first 30 years, it seems relatively strong and as we go into the last 20 years, um, 
that starts to fade. There isn't as much uh, involvement, and not necessarily because the tribe doesn't want to be involved. I think it's very much the opposite. They wish to, to maintain their involvement, um, but involvement is about possession. And if you do not own land in the European mindset, then you have no voting rights. So the fewer individuals in town who own land, it, that means that you do not have the ability to vote. So there, there is definitely that change, thank you, um, that is going to start uh, during this time period of Stephen West. West is going to continue um, to be the head of the mission during his uh, time period as minister here in Stockbridge, but his heart is never in it. He is not, that is not a focus. His flock is, is not the same flock that Sargent had and is not the same flock that Edwards had. His flock is now English speaking. His flock is now looking at various different other pieces. And so it's, it, it is there, but if somebody else wants to take on that responsibility, please do. Be, be happy to do that. And eventually that's exactly what happens in 1774, 1775. Uh, it stops. The mission concludes. And at that point in time... West divests himself of the idea of being the mission minister. He just is going to focus on his, his English subjects at that point in time. And this is where there's that transition from uh, the minister that's here, and now there's a segregation. Now the, the tribal members have a completely separate minister in John Sargent Jr. And he will continue with them going forward as they eventually move into New York State. West, I mentioned his personalities and so on. West had a tendency, um, because he's a rule follower, that if you did something wrong, he called you out on it. And it didn't matter whether it was public, private, uh, both. Uh, he made sure that he knew that you did something wrong. And what better place than from right here? He would, not here actually, he was up the road. No, this, we hadn't built this yet. But, um, but West would admonish his people, his, his, uh, his flock from the pulpit. And he would admonish them in town and... I can imagine that that must have been rather embarrassing for some people uh, to have the minister stand up in front of the congregation on a Sunday and talk about everything that you did wrong over the course of the week. I heard that, mm, oh, who's going to get it today? And the native population was not exempt from that ridicule, from that embarrassment. And I think that this also had something to do with um, a distrust and a displeasure uh, when it comes to the tribe and Stephen West. Uh, West would talk about how he was really slightly disappointed in the number of tribal members who would attend services on Sunday. Sometimes there would be 15, sometimes there may be 50. Uh, sometimes it had to do with what time of year it was and so on, but he did not feel as though his his indigenous flock was paying attention to what he had to say. I don't know if I blame them. If they're calling me out from the pulpit, I don't know that I would want to continue to attend. There was one member of the tribe who was excommunicated by West um, at one point. It took nine years, nine years of appeals for her to be readmitted to the congregation. Stephen West also went after Johannes Metoxen at one point. And Metoxen is a, a tribal elder. He is uh, of advanced age at this point in time, but he was a fighter. 
and he was not going to back down. He confronted West from the pulpit, read a statement, and even suggested that West should be let go as minister in Stockbridge. That didn't happen at that point in time, but it was out there. And I don't know that uh, he was the first person to suggest that, um, perhaps because of a rigidness that was unwavering. But it will be during, it will be during Stephen West's time as minister here that the tribe leaves. It will be 1783 again, um, when the call comes out after the shot heard around the world and, and so on, we enter into the time period of the American Revolution. There is a fear of what could happen. There's a fear of the British and their native allies and the French and their native allies and so on and the colonists and so on. Who's going to protect us? Who's going to be here? Well, I don't know. Will you protect us? Absolutely. We will take up arms. We will gladly do this. Um, and they do. Again, they're here. They protect. They go and they fight in uh, many of the major battles. Uh, and yet, when they return, they're given a, an oxen by General Washington. There's a big party in July. And three months later, most of them are gone. They've moved on. There's nothing here. They are a stranger in a strange world. By that time, by 1783, they are no longer the major population. In, in 1735, there was Sargent and there was Woodbridge. And then there was the tribe. And eventually, as I said, the tribe, their numbers increase, but so does the number of English-speaking inhabitants. And it shifts. By the time we get into that midpoint or later part of the 18th century, there are nearly a thousand people here who are English speaking, and there are just over a hundred and some odd Native Americans, indigenous members of the tribe. So because of that shift, they are strangers in what used to be a familiar, but is now a strange land. Patrick Frazier, mentions in his writing that New England civilization had come a little too quickly to the Stockbridge Mohicans. In the 50 years since John Sargent had first stepped foot in the Housatonic village, the Indian population was never so much more than 200. But as of September of 1783, there were just under 1,000 white families and another 40 African families that were free in this area. And unbeknownst to the indigenous population, the acceptance of Christianity sped that on. They thought that this was going to be something that was going to be a positive. This was going to be something that helped that I know I mentioned in April that the idea of asking Sargent and, and Woodbridge to come out was to kind of a, a preemptive move. They knew that something was coming. They'd already dealt with the, the Dutch a little bit. So let's see, let's beat them at their own game. And it backfired. It didn't work the way that they had intended. By, I believe it's, uh, 1788, 1789, uh, Stockbridge has lost all of its, or pretty much all of its indigenous population. They have moved from this area. They've taken advantage of their relationship with the Oneidas, so they've moved on to New York State. And then eventually, as history goes on, they will make their way eventually to Wisconsin. So there's 
it's, it's an interesting look at what has happened over the years, um, how you go from the overwhelming majority in a population to being the minority in the population, to being somewhat in terms of, uh, in terms of the church and in terms of the school integrated and by the time you're finished, segregated. Um, so there's that. Um, and with that, I don't know that I have anything more to talk about. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. I was interested uh, to hear the uh, story about excommunicating the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, I read somewhere, and I don't, can't remember where it is, but I came here you know, listening for that because what I read <coughs> indicated that the pastor was being done west at that time. I got to a point where he, in effect, excommunicated the community. I, I, I don't know whether that's an exaggeration or a misuse of the term excommunicated, but can you clarify whether or not the, the act of excommunicating applied just to this one person in, in this rather dramatic event, or was there a broader um, decision by the church leadership at that time to really exclude <coughs> So um, Ron's question was about excommunication of the tribal members over time uh, and the fact that I had mentioned that there was one, uh, one female member of the congregation that was excommunicated and, and so on. My understanding from what I've read is that in, in what I spoke of was an individual example, but over time that... I don't know if everybody in the tribe was excommunicated, but there were a number of individuals who are, were excommunicated. One of the things that I, is in my head that I, I guess I didn't write down as much as I thought I did, um, alcohol is a huge issue that dates back to their interaction with the Dutch even before uh, John Sargent is here, that there are some who... And again, this is various different opinions and, and looking at the situation. Um, some believe that even the Dutch were plying tribe, tribal members with alcohol in order to get them to kind of not be so greedy um, or feel as though they should get more for what they were giving up, whether it was land or, or whatever it is. So they would ply them with alcohol. Um, during West's time, there are... I believe a number of examples where members of the tribe, male members of the tribe in particular, are excommunicated because of alcoholism. And so that is one of the, the leading issues. But each, each one of the three ministers, Sargent talks about it before he even is here in that three month period when he goes to leave to return to Yale, there had been some type of a hoopla the night before and in his journal, he talks about how uh, a number of the tribal members were inebriated or were incapacitated over the fact that, uh, that this had happened. Um, there is another example where when they were deciding whether or not to accept the whole idea of Christianity to have a minister come out, that there was uh, potentially some talk of uh, possibly poisoning Mpachini and Konkapot, um, and that there were two tribal members who drank too much and dropped dead, and that perhaps they were the ones who received the cup rather than, um, than Mpachini and, and Konkapot. There are different times where Sargent and Edwards try to make pacts with members of the tribe or with the tribe itself, saying, look, you know, I, I can only do so much. You have to stay off the bottle. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, 
even in the archives, we have ledgers from some of the different stores that were around uh, dated 1780s, and you can pick out, uh, I think there was Peter P., uh, I will not insult him by trying to butcher his last name, that is repeatedly in there over and over again, half a dozen times during the course of the week, going in and purchasing alcohol. So uh, I don't know whether the whole tribe was excommunicated. I don't believe that there was, because of rules, because of, of protocol and so on, I, I believe that West would have needed a reason in order to, uh, to divest everybody at once. Um, and I haven't seen anything. Uh, but there is a fair file that has all of these different confessions and different things um, that people read uh, because of West and his rules. Yes, so there is a, there are three, uh, three shelves at least, four shelves at least, uh, worth of, of material that is church documents, church records that actually belong to the church, but they were brought to the museum and archives at some point for safekeeping. Uh, but we do, we have a, a record book that I may have brought back in April that, ha that lists the baptisms of tribal members, children, and adults. Um, and is that the one that was written like in the 1850s, looking back, trying to reestablish all the names? There is there's one book that, that pretty much covers the time period of Stephen West uh, that goes up to, there's one book that goes up to 18, 1815, 1818, and then there's a second book that goes up through the 1850s. So if anyone is really interested in just looking at this, we have a photocopy of the, that list of names that's outside here in the, in the library. And I've gone through, because it's photocopied, I went through and highlighted all the Indian names so that you can see, you know, just glance through and see all the names of the people that were brought into the congregation by baptism up until, you know, throughout that whole period. And, you know, I want to take up too much of your time. It's not quite dinner time, but um, <laughs> it, it, is, it is interesting, you know, looking at, uh, there's, a, there's a reference in one of the, the books about how even, so Samuel Kirkland, who is going to be associated with Hamilton College and is going to be a missionary and, and so on, Oneida and, and whatnot, at one point he lives here and even he as a missionary, as somebody who's working with the indigenous population and so on, um, jokes about the fact that he purchased land here in Stockbridge with monies that were donated for the purpose of working with as a missionary, um, and how cheap it was because it was because it was native land. Um, I think that's kind of a major slap in the face. Um, considering what he was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, in the time when the indigenous population physically was that there was that exposure, or was that other indigenous folks coming here and also the reverse as it was gradually forming more individual? Or maybe, I don't know, how, how the groups were, but were they just sort of joining? So I, my understanding is that the oh yeah sorry um, so there was a question about the uh, the population and, and whether the growth in population was due to growth in numbers from family or whether it was growth because of other people coming into the area. Um, my understanding is that it was growth in family numbers. And, however, that being said, uh, in because of the schools, because of the, the idea of the mission that was going on, there definitely was an influx over again of other tribal members from Oneida, Mohawk, um, that would come into the area 
um, and then leave. Sometimes it would only be for a year, sometimes it would be a, a longer period of time. Um, there's also uh, the idea that the Moravians who were over in New York State and the work that they did. Um, so but my, my understanding is that it was family growth and not necessarily people. And then the decline of that also is not necessarily, so part of the decline is happening post-Revolutionary War. So there are a number of tribal members who are, are killed during the war. Um, I think some of them may have started to move off uh, and move over to Oneida territory slightly earlier, but I think part of it was just um, natural causes and the, uh, and the revolution. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, though, after the tribe leaves in 1783, that time period between 1783 and I'm going to say 1789, um, there are people who come back and forth. They don't just leave and never return. Some, some people will go back and forth, which is not that surprising because that's also what uh, Jonathan Ed, or John Sargent Jr. did as well. He did not necessarily stay out in Oneida territory. He still had um, family here. And sometimes the, the male would leave and go and then come back and bring the rest of the family um, and that's what Sargent did too. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.